Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the 14th part of what if Deku was in villain class 1A. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 31, Why Are You Doing This? Momo. Yurika shrieked as Yayorosa hurried into view. Yurika had her mouth covered with the crook of her elbow. She took the gas mask that Momo handed out without hesitation. I'll keep going, proclaimed Kiri's Hima. Pass me some masks. As Yurika helped Sue put on her own mask, Momo made an extra armful of masks. Kiri's Hima took them with a nod and hurried off into the gloom. We heard Mandalay's message. Yurika explained. We started to come back but had to go around this fog. Is it poisonous, Ribbit? Tsu asked. We believe so, Momo nodded gravely. Midoriya said it's either poison or sleeping gas. We have to gather everyone we can and take them back to the lodge, that's our top priority. The two of you should head back, I'll catch up with Kiri's Hima. Yurika furrowed her brow. Deku must be back at the lodge, that was the best place for him to be. The unspoken rule was that whenever Deku wasn't around, they followed Momo's orders without fault. But. Oh. What would Deku do? And this was the moment that Mandalay's second message echoed in their minds. A message that urged them to fight back. Students of Class A and B. By the permission of the pro hero, Eraserhead, you are permitted to use your quirks to protect yourself and others, until you are back under our protection. There was more to it than that, but those words were all Yurika needed to hear. She looked to Momo with certainty on her face, we have to go after whoever's making this guess. She shook her head, it's too dangerous. Think about it. The gas isn't moving naturally. If it did, it would have spread out and thinned across the entire forest. Instead, it's concentrated in a vortex around this area. That means the quirk user must be in the middle, and likely has some way to defend themselves. The best way forwards is to evacuate the forest and regroup. Eurica started to pace back and forth as she thought this through. Deku had said to her before that her constant notes in his books made him think like her sometimes. Who said the other way around wasn't true as well. We're facing someone who has a poisonous gas quirk, she said aloud. It spirals in a vortex, so it must be super thick around them. So, visibility is reduced. We, don't know if the villain is affected by their own gas, but if it's a vortex, like a cyclone, there'll be an eye of the storm, wherever the villain is standing, there's gonna be a small area where there is no gas at all. So, visibility won't be reduced when we actually reach them. Okay, what other advantages might the villain have? Um. What if they can feel movement in the gas? Tsu acknowledged. Eureka clicked her fingers and pointed back at her, right? So, we've gotta be super stealthy. What if, we went from above? Look for the eye of the storm. Momo wasn't stopping them, so Eureka kept going. Okay, okay, support items, what items might they have? A gas mask. Tsu said, tapping her chin with her finger thoughtfully. Only if they're affected by their own gas. The gas isn't moving, Momo pointed out, now engrossed in this thought process too, which means the villain is standing still. Right? So, they need to be protected if someone jumps them. Armor. Maybe something to trap people, like your net gun. Or a gun in general. Tsu said darkly. They wavered for a moment. It's too dangerous, Momo said again, shaking her head. You can help me hand out masks if you want. Either that or go to the lodge. The villain isn't attacking anyone, so they're best left unprovoked. What else would Deku write in his notebook about this person? Right? Their greatest weakness from class A. Someone stealthy. Yurika, Hagakure, Shoji, Jiro, someone who could go from above. Yurika, someone who could knock them out quickly. Kaminari, Sato, Ajiro. Kiri's Hima, maybe Shinso? Oh, and someone who could protect against a weapon like a gun, that would be Kiri's Hima again. Yurika slammed her fist into her open palm, okay, the villain's greatest weaknesses from Class A army and Kiri's Hima. We need to find him again, and she took off in the direction her peer had disappeared off to. Okako. Wait. Momo exclaimed. She and Tsu quickly ran after her. They charged through the undergrowth. 
It was tough in the dark, but Eurika did her best to track the broken branches and disturbed leaves Kiri's Himmel left in his wake. The weather had been dry, there were few footprints to follow, not that she could see them anyway. As they went, the fog grew thicker. She noted how the fog was wherever the fire was not. Was it flammable? That could be dangerous if Kikan or Shoto used their powers. They definitely needed to take this gas villain out. Soon enough, Eurika heard quiet chatter. Hello, she called out, aware that it might be dangerous, but wanting to make sure they didn't frighten anyone on their side. Pushing through another bush, Eurika came across Kendo, from Class B, as well as Tetsu Tetsu and a couple of unconscious friends. They all wore gas masks, Kiri's Hima must have already passed through here. Oh no, said Eurika, kneeling down beside the unconscious girls from Class B. They're just sleeping, we're pretty sure, Kendo explained. It's a sleeping gas, thank goodness, Momo sighed as she and Tsu caught up. Kiri's Hima told us to take these two back to camp, Class B's president explained. Now you girls are here, take them back. I'm going after this gas villain, proclaimed Tetsu Tetsu, already prepared to run off and do just that. Wait. Eureka explained, no, that's what we're doing too. We'll help. But she saw the way he hesitated, eyes shifting over them, and realized, you, don't trust us, do you? He gritted his teeth and glared at the ground, look, I trust Kiri's Hima, okay. He's my friend. But you've gotta understand. Someone would have had to leak this location, broadcast it, somehow. There's been a traitor amongst you before, and there's one now, why else would the villains attack whilst my class is all in the woods? There's, a second traitor? Momo gently pushed her aside to step forwards, I understand your fears. I too have been mulling them over, but now is not the time to put a wedge in between us. We must work together, and Eureka is right, facing the villain producing this gas is our best hope. We're offering to help you. He looked conflicted, but regardless, said, fine, but if a single one of you double cross us. We understand, Momo said surely. Eureka nodded bitterly in the background. Tetsu Tetsu's quirk is very similar to Kirishima's, Tsu pointed out, undeterred by the confrontation, your analysis still applies, Okako. All right, she nodded. Then let's go. After some discussion, Tsu agreed to stay behind and keep an eye on the two unconscious Class B girls. Tetsu Tetsu was unsure, but Kendo's certainty seemed to comfort him. They plowed on into the mist, Tetsu Tetsu leading the way as the air grew thicker, and the gas masks began to struggle. I'll go up the trees, Eureka explained in a hushed voice once they believed they were close. Momo nodded, I IVE used up a lot of my power on these masks. It might be best that I stay back and try to capture the villain if they try and run off. The two of you can. Go in alone, Tetsu Tetsu finished for her, a threatening look in his eye. Why does it feel like you're trying to back away and leave us to fight this guy? The only reason Eureka hadn't punched him yet was because he was literally made of steel. Kendo tried to reason with him, but Momo insisted his concerns were well placed. She said she'd come in too. Eureka could play back up instead. Not liking this at all, Eureka jumped up into the trees. The gas was still potent up there, but she felt like she could breathe a little easier. After hopping slowly and carefully from branch to branch for a little longer, she stopped, spying the silhouette of a stranger, just below. Don't think I can't see you, a man's voice called out calmly. Eureka tensed up. She didn't know where the others were, could the villain see them? I'm surprised my gas hasn't affected you. But no matter, you won't get any further. Just below her, Eureka could barely see the figures of the other three, frozen just before the eye of the vortex of gas. Society lifts heroes like you up. But, they tend to forget, don't they? You're still only human. And with a bang, a bullet was fired, coupled by a scream. Eureka panicked and leapt forwards, bursting into the clear in the center of the vortex. Below, she could see Tetsu Tetsu on the ground, his skin silver. He was in front of Momo, had he dived to take the bullet. The villain, smaller than Eureka was expecting, simply sighed in annoyance and began to reload his weapon. Stop right there. Kendo darted forwards. Her hands enlarged before their very eyes, knocking the villain to the ground with startling strength. He scrambled away, pointing his gun. And Eureka dropped from the sky. He would never have expected it, 
and Eureka had experience in disarming opponents. The gun was in her possession in seconds. As soon as her maneuver was completed, Tetsu Tetsu, still bleeding from his nose, swooped in with a powerful punch, smashing the mask the villain was wearing in an instant. As he fell to the ground, Tetsu Tetsu said, there's only one thing to do when a gas user's wearing a mask, break it. Eureka had the gun pointed at the man, no. The gas begun to clear, and she realized, this was just a kid, a kid in a middle school uniform. She lowered her weapon, eyes wide, ears deaf to the conversation between Momo and Tetsu Tetsu that followed. All she could think about was what he was doing here. Someone that was only a year or two younger than herself. She dropped the gun and clasped her hands over her mouth. This boy would be in class next, wouldn't he? Torch. What? Utility belt, you idiot. Manoma scrambled for the thing on the belt he was wearing, Midoriya's belt. He found the flashlight just in time to shine it on dark shadows approaching claws, the beam shaking along with Manoma's hands as the monster screeched and backed away. Good thinking, Shoji panted, blood dripping from the ends of one of his many, produced limbs. At least he could grow that hand back. Midoriya snatched the torch off Manoma and increased the beam's intensity, marching closer to Dark Shadow as it shrunk slowly back into Tokoyami. WYD do you have, why do you have a torch W with such high P power? Manoma stuttered, clearly more than terrified of Tokoyama's quirk, which had quickly grown out of control in the night. Midoriya pointed to the scar on his cheek unceremoniously. That belt is filled with all sorts of methods of defeating my own classmates, I'll have you know. Manoma stared, but, why? It's a smart idea, that's why, Shoji replied coldly. Oh yeah, the rest of classes still hated Manoma, didn't they? Well, Midoriya would consider himself friends with him now, and he still understood that thought process. T thank you, Tokoyami stammered as Midoriya helped him to his feet. No problem, and Midoriya handed over the miniature torch to him, just to be safe. The two of them hadn't found many people in the woods so far. Avoiding the gas due to Manoma's lack of a gas mask didn't help. It wasn't like Midoriya's mask was functional at this point anyway. And Midoriya was slowing down, that much was obvious. He didn't know how badly he was hurt, but he was sure he would once the adrenaline had faded. Head back to the lodge, Midoriya insisted. We're going to keep looking for the others. Do you know what pier was ahead of you? Midoriya, you need to come back too, Shoji said with immense concern. I have to find Shoto, he voiced. Okay, maybe he did have some priorities here. His. I it's Dabby, Dabby's here, I have to find him. They hesitated, glancing between each other. Shoto and Bakugo were the pair ahead of us, Shoji finally explained. Then they were close. Wait, Shoji called out, grasping Midoriya's wrist before he could leave. A villain with a blade quirk attacked us, that's why Dark Shadow grew wild, he was startled and saw that I was hurt. That villain must have gone ahead. They might be fighting Bakugo and Shoto now. Midoriya nodded, undeterred. Take Tokoyami back to the lodge. The gas seems to be gone now. If you find anyone else along the way, take them back too. A lot of class B is probably unconscious, so keep an eye out. Shoji responded by forming a blinking eye on the end of one of his tentacle-like limbs. Under his mask, Midoriya knew he was smiling. Good luck, Tokoyami spoke up, a little weakly, as the two of them started to walk away from the carnage Dark Shadow had left behind. As they left Manoma spoke up, they just listen to you without question, don't they? Midoriya shrugged, there's usually more resistance when it comes to me wanting to go do things by myself. It's probably different because you're here, let's go. Manoma was quick to catch up as Midoriya ran on ahead, I don't have any quirks anymore, remember, he hissed. My timer ran out. It's been way more than five minutes. Then why didn't you copy Tokoyama's or Shoji's? I'm not copying Tokoyama's, he snapped, almost tripping over a tree root. And Shoji's wouldn't work. Right, mutations, Midoriya nodded, not requiring further explanation. Of course, Minoma's copying ability had limitations, and the ability to spontaneously mutate his own body in mirroring someone's quirk was bound to be one of them. Shoji had been right. They didn't need to go far at all before they heard fighting. Kakan was as loud as ever, and the sudden drop in temperature was a clear indication of Shoto's presence. As Manoma nervously loaded the grappling bolt, they tiptoed towards the scene. 
just two quirkless idiots, about to get themselves killed, Monoma muttered bitterly. Midoriya chose to ignore him. Just around a tree trunk, Midoriya could see pillars of ice scattering around a clearing. A man in full black, in a straight jacket, seemingly danced around in the air, blades extending from his teeth. For such a seemingly difficult power to manage, he was adept at wielding it. Shoto skidded around on his ice, desperately trying to embolize the villain. Whenever he got close, however, the ice was shattered with those blades. Kaken was doing his best to, but clearly avoiding using his power much. It could have been in fear of setting fire to the trees, maybe partly due to the cold inhibiting his ability. Regardless, they were fighting a losing battle. That villain needed to be taken out, and quickly. Now what? Monoma whispered, gripping onto one of Midoriya's sleeves in obvious fear that Midoriya knew he would deny. Just give me that, he retorted, snatched the grappling bolt from Monoma's grip, and lined up his shot. Monoma's method of taking out Muscular had given him the idea. And with a phantom ache in Midoriya's shoulder, he pulled the trigger, and the bolt was fired out in the blink of an eye, burying itself in the villain's shoulder with a surprised yell. Midoriya dug his feet into the ground and retracted it, the villain flying towards the floor as the wire embedded in his side yanked him harshly downwards. The moment he made contact with the floor, Midoriya was there, and with a method he'd learned from Ajiro that had absolutely terrified him at the time, knocked him out cold with a harsh kick to a pressure point on the side of his throat. They stared at him. You're welcome, Midoriya sighed, reloading the grappling bolt. It hadn't even embedded that deeply into the villain, he was surprised that even worked, it must have mainly caught the fabric of his shirt. What the hell? Kaken yelled. Midoriya shoved the weapon back at Monoma and switched his sword back to his right hand as he marched over to them. I'd freeze him, if I were you, Midoriya told Shoto, who did just that before the Toothblade villain could come to. Are you okay? Shoto asked immediately, breathing steam in the frigid air. Just how bad did Midoriya look? I'm fine, he insisted. Why you really not, Monoma interjected, yanking his shoes out of the ice he'd been frozen to the ground with. Midoriya, no offense, but you look like you could pass out at any moment. You found Shoto, now let's go. Midoriya hated to admit it, especially in front of Kaken, but he was right. We need to go back to the lodge, Monoma insisted. Yeah, Shoto nodded, clearly still frazzled. Good idea. We have one of your classmates here too. Monoma blinked as Shoto indicated to the unconscious body, slumped up against a tree and surrounded by a protective wall of ice. Suburba, Monoma muttered in shock, hurrying over to him. Shoto helped him lift him onto Monoma's back as Kaken made his excuses. You three go back, take that guy with you, Kaken growled, I'm finding the rest of these damned villains and teaching them a lesson. Don't be an idiot, Midoriya replied, too tired to shout. You're the idiot who ran all the way in here and clearly picked fights with villains indefinitely better than you. Well, that explains why I took that guy out in two seconds, he snapped sarcastically. You had your chance, and then spent too long fighting this villain. There's no time to fight, voiced Shoto, stepping in between them. The fire is getting closer. Midoriya hadn't noticed. He'd been so focused on pushing through this, that he'd almost completely zoned out. But now he could hear it, the crackling of not too distant flames, inching ever closer through the dry undergrowth. Which way's the lodge? Monoma asked no one in particular, shifting Tsuburaba into a more secure position on his back. Away from the fire, Midoriya replied, not knowing if it was the truth. They began to walk, after Monoma tapped Kaken's head to copy his quirk and Kaken had instantly lashed out, that was, Shoto had far less complaints about his power being copied. Midoriya? Midoriya? He blinked, what? Shoto stared back at him, I thought you were about to pass out. I'm fine, Midoriya retorted, although he was starting not to believe it. His fight with Muscular hadn't been long, but the villain had certainly enjoyed taunting him. He'd been thrown against rocks, tossed aside like a rag doll, almost beaten senseless. Every inch of his body ached. There was more than one cut on his head, and unpleasant memories of what a concussion felt like were starting to become familiar once more, as the world persisted to spin, and his knees grew weak. How he had managed to fight it off for this long was beyond him, but he decided it was better not questioned. Shoto stopped and shook his head, no, no, you're definitely not. We need to keep moving, Midoriya insisted, 
trudging on ahead. That fire, you know it's. Dabby, Shoto replied simply. Hurry the hell up. Kakan yelled back at them. Would you quit being so loud? Manoma shouted in response. Can't you class A idiots realize that we could be ambushed at any moment? The words of their argument grew distant, slurring together. Midoriya tried to fight against it. He hated feeling his weak. But the blackness came so quickly, one minute he was aware and standing, and the next. Like class B is freaking superior. Bakugo snapped at Manoma. The rest of your bloody class is probably lying unconscious in a freaking bush. You're carrying one of them. No thanks to you, the freaking copycat replied. Someone from class A had to have leaked this place's location. You're not all saints. One of you might have done it, Bakugo hissed. Or maybe one of class A had been bugged. Damn it. Why was he feeling protective over his damned class? This was all Deku's freaking. He turned around, and they weren't there. Shut the hell up, Bakugo said, covering a hand over Manoma's mouth to stop his yapping. The leech batted it away and opened his gob to say something else insensitive, before he cast his eyes to where Bakugo was looking, and came to the same, dreaded realization. Midoriya, he called out quickly, 15. Stupid numbers. Ah. Uh, the two of you had been so busy being so argumentative, that you completely missed my magic trick. The two of them looked up to the trees. Up there, was a masked man in a top hat and a trench coat. He wore black gloves, and twiddled between his fingers, two glass marbles. What the hell? Bakugo murmured under his breath. Where those marbles? I took your friends with my power, I used to be a street performer, you know. Hey. Give them back. Manoma yelled uselessly, pointing the crossbow thing that Deku had started carrying around at the villain, trying to keep Suburba secure, all the while. Give them back, he chuckled, they're not your possessions. We're here to set them free. Why are all villains so freaking delusional? Bakugo didn't care about Shoto's blabbering about not setting fire to the forest. He took off with a blast, leaving Manoma coughing on smoke in his wake. The masked magician took off, bounding from tree to tree ahead of him. But Bakugo knew he wouldn't be able to get far. With a grin, he set off in pursuit. He'd show Deku, Bakugo wasn't freaking weak. And then all of a sudden, a wall of ice appeared out of nowhere in front of the villain. It must have been freaking leech, hidden below the canopies. Yet, the villain didn't seem worried. A wave of his hand and a hole formed in the ice, marbles scattering around him and he vaulted through. Bakugo tried to follow, but some of those marbles burst in his face, knocking him out of the sky and down through the trees, every single branch possible hitting him in the face on the way down. Growling, Bakugo pushed through the stinging pain and got back to his feet, taking off at a run and trying to ignore the throbbing in his hands, the strain that his quirk was taking. A cry caught his attention. He changed direction, skidding in the dirt and almost falling over as he sprinted towards the yell. He stumbled upon a clearing, where the unconscious class B idiot lay motionless before him, and Leech was not far ahead, shielding his face and friend from an onslaught of blue flame, thrown by a scarred man with a manic grin. Dabby. The villain spotted Bakugo and rolled his eyes. Compress, we're leaving, he told the magician bastard. Fat chance. Bakugo yelled as he charged forwards, leaping over Manoma and tossing a ball of fire at their faces, hoping to scar them just a little more. Both dodged expertly, and Bakugo was suddenly yanked backwards by something which wrapped itself around his torso, a tape measure. Hey back off. Not cool. Do it again. With whiplash from both this conversation and the third villain's sudden appearance, Bakugo quickly realized he was outnumbered. Get up, he hissed to copycat, who was by his feet, lying before Chisaburaba. But Bakugo took one look at the red, raw skin on the back of his hands and arms, and realized he was alone in this fight. Then so be it. The magician was his target, so that's who he aimed for. He expertly dodged and weaved past numerous attacks, increasingly frustrated on how the guy just stood there and watched. With a frustrated cry, he turned and sent a powerful blow in the direction of the black and white idiot with the tape measure. He evaded with a backflip, and now Bakugo was ready to blow his freaking arms off. But before he could, with a purple glow, a figure made of mist operat out of nowhere, towering before Dabby, calm as could be. It's been five minutes since the signal, the warp villain, the same from the USJ, proclaimed. Let's go, Dabby. 
Around the clearing, several, swirling portals opened. See you around. Never again, exclaimed tape measure guy, who dived through the nearest portal without a second thought. No, they were going to get away. Now. And from the bushes came a brilliant beam of light, skimming the side of the magician's coat and bursting a hole through its pocket. Out, rolling two distinct marbles, Deku and Icy Hot, it had to be. But Bakugo was just a little too far away, and someone else got to them first. Fortunately enough, it wasn't a real villain. Purple-haired Shinso dove from the same bush the laser had come from, grabbed the marbles, and rolled across the clearing to Bakugo's side. Aoyama run, he cried, and the bloody Sparkle Boy yelped as he ran for his freaking life. Bakugo hated to admit that he'd needed that help, but, good freaking job. Thanks, Shinso grinned slyly, gripping the marbles firmly in his fist. Dabby rolled his eyes and held out his hand to send another torrent of flame right at them. Just in time, Monoma skidded in front of them, and after a deep breath, blew on the air before them, creating an invisible shield characteristic of Tsuburaba's solid air quirk, Bakugo had seen it before in the sports festival. The shield shattered and broke under the intense heat, but it had done its job. Dabby looked even more frustrated. Come on, let's go. Shinso, Bakugo hadn't thought of a nickname for him yet, he was considering eye bags, yelled, taking a few steps back. Compress, Dabby snarled, gesturing towards them as an invitation to help. No matter, let us leave, the magician, Compress, simply replied. We're not leaving without. Oh, no matter, he waved it off. They seemed so proud of themselves for rooting through my pockets that I thought I'd let them gloat. What are you talking about? Ibags exclaimed. Compress let out a laugh, reached up to his mask, about to take it off, and then froze. What? Dabby growled. And Bakugo realized what had just happened. Show them, now. Shinso ordered. Compress finished taking off his mask, his expression blank as he plucked the two real marbles from his mouth, the ones Shinso was holding must have been decoys, made from when Monoma made that stupid ice wall. Toss them to us and release them. Shinso ordered as Dabby clocked onto what was happening. Compress held back his hand, ready to throw the orbs towards them, but before he could, Dabby swung his own fist and punched him in the head, seemingly ready to fight his own teammates to get Shoto back, and Deku too. The marbles in Shinso's grasp burst into shards of ice, as Bakugo had expected, at the same time as a heavily injured Deku and shocked Shoto reappeared before the villain's feet, and Compress stumbled to regain his composure. Shinso swore under his breath and backed away a little more. Dabby grabbed Shoto by the collar of his shirt. As Compress stumbled backwards through his portal, Dabby tossed Shoto through his own before he could even figure out where he was. He yanked Deku to his feet and wrapped his hand around his neck. Midoriya. Shinso cried out. Before he could even think, Bakugo charged forwards, his hand reaching out, D.E.K.U. But he was too late. Tsu had a lot on her hands at the moment. It was no well-guarded secret that Tsu was one of the most respected members of her class, amongst both her peers and their teachers. She was in class A in the first place for standing up to bullies, and she didn't exactly stop doing that now she was here. She was always looking after people, it was her nature. She'd say her closest friends would be Okako and Midoriya. They were both very cool people, and she was honored to know them so well. Maybe that's why it scared her so much, when Okako broke down crying beside her, and Midoriya was nowhere to be seen. It didn't help that Momo had disappeared too. She wanted to go after Kiri's Hima, but no one had seen her since. They should never have let her leave. It's going to be okay, Okako, she told her, resting a hand on her shoulder. Breathing through heavy sobs, Okako turned to look at her with big, watery eyes. Titsu. Yes, Ribbit. W we, we see can T fix it, can we? Tsu frowned, fix what? Okako's eyes drifted to the detainment vehicle not far from where they were sighting. The police and paramedics had arrived not long ago, as classes slowly gathered everyone they could from the forest. The rest of it was being swept now, as the fires were put out. The system, she murmured. It took Tsu a moment to realize what she was talking about. The boy that they had defeated, the one with the gun and the gas quirk. He'd called himself Mustard and was a middle school student only a year younger than themselves. They knew next to nothing about him, but they didn't need to. Just the look on his face as he was taken in, 
that was all they needed to see to understand. He was just like them. Sure, W we can graduate, Okako continued, staring at her hands, we can be heroes, like Deku said. But, but there will still be class as. T there are always G going, going to be kids like us who make the same mistakes and end up in the same place A and they're not gonna have people like Deku to H help them. Chitsu rubbed circles on her friend's back as she spoke, listening intently to every word she said. She was so very right. After a moment more of silence, and de-stressing sobs, Chitsu pulled Okako closer into a hug. She latched on immediately, falling into her. How can we be heroes if we can't help the villains, she whispered. Chitsu didn't know. She, she didn't. Bakugo. The two girls jerked up at the sound of Kirishima's cry. He ran across the grass towards Bakugo, who was just leaving the forest, covered in scorch marks, scratches and bruises. Beside him was Shinso and Aoyama, an unlikely group, but Tsu remembered Shinso being paired up with Aoyama under the blissful ignorance of the test of courage. They'd gone in just ahead of Bakugo and Shoto, which led to the question. Where's Shoto? Tsu asked, standing up as they got close. Bakugo's fearsome glare turned to her. She glared back, almost startled when that look in his eyes softened. A millisecond later and he furrowed his brow and stared at the ground. Tsu wondered if that was a look of, shame. Guilt. She'd never seen such emotions on Bakugo before. Just behind the group, came another couple of people. There was Minoma, with someone else from Class B on his back. Tsu couldn't recall his name, but he must have been knocked unconscious by the gas. Minoma? Are you okay? Kiri's Hima interrogated, spying the harsh burns up his arms at the same time as Tsu. Weren't you with Midoriya? Sato said so. He opened his mouth to reply but was quickly interrupted by the arrival of a paramedic, who soon whisked him away to get treated. Tsu didn't like this, Bakugo, what happened, she quizzed. More people were gathering around them now. Quite a lot had gotten back to the lodge uninjured, carrying limp members of Class B as they went. I he started. Help came a sudden cry. Another figure stumbled out of the thickets. Please, help, he yelled. It was another awake member of Class B, an honest rarity. Aways, yelled Kendo, rushing past. Who's? Momo. Okako screamed as soon as they realized who was on Aways' back. Tsu rushed forwards along with the rest of them. Momo was more than just one of her best friends, she was Class A's second in command. Without her or Midoriya around, they'd been letting Aitza organize the growing crowd, who was as panicked and fearful as the rest. Tsu had been eager for Momo's easy smile and comforting words. But here she was, their warrior, limp and blooded. Her iconic ponytail had been lost, the band snapped, leaving long, dark hair, flowing like waterfalls over her shoulders, hiding her face. Momo. Yeyorozu. Okako continued to screech. But before she could get any closer, it was Bakugo who held her back, letting a paramedic reach their friend and lift her carefully onto a stretcher, instantly tending to the obvious wounds on her head. Aways looked more than frazzled, but other than that, okay. What happened? Tsu heard Kendo say. Anomu, Aways breathed. Came out of nowhere, I was helping Yeyorozu hand out masks and then that gas went, so we started to head back, she got really tired. Then that that thing jumped us. I thought we were goners, for sure. But then it just stopped, walked off before it could. He didn't need to finish that sentence. All the villains left, Bakugo explained, letting Okako go now that Momo was out of sight. That warp bastard from the USJ turned up. Nomu are monsters, right? Whoever gives it orders must have told it to turn around and go through a portal. W.Y. Okako stammered, as desperate for answers as Tsu was. Why did they leave? What did they want? They wanted Shoto, voiced Aitza, now standing beside Tsu, didn't they? Bakugo couldn't meet his eyes. Bakugo, you were with Shoto when you entered the forest. What happened? Aitza ordered. He just gritted his teeth, head hung as he stared at the ground. They got no answers out of him, but they didn't need to. Kiri's Hima reached out to put a hand on his friend's shoulder, but he was shrugged off immediately. Bakugo marched away to be alone. They turned to Shinso. He sighed, look, I know I'm new here, and I still don't know all of you that well, but, you're good people, okay. 
This, this isn't your fault. What happened? Aitsa demanded, fists clenched. Shinso didn't flinch at the aggression, knowing Aitsa was as scared as he was, as they all were. I don't know what led up to it, but Aoyama and I found the villain's rendezvous point. We waited there, and eventually Minoma and Bakugo showed up, chasing some magician guy. We stayed hidden long enough to figure out he had some kind of quirk that could, trap people, in these little orbs or something. I, I tried my best to get them back but... Tsu stepped forwards. Shinso was a lot taller than her. They'd barely spoken, but Tsu was good at reading emotions. She could see it in his eyes, the disappointment, the sorrow. She wrapped her arms around him and hugged him close. He seemed surprised, raising his arms up a little as if unsure what to do with them. Thank you for trying, Tsu told him, almost hiccuping on the lump in her throat. She pulled away, trying to deny the tears in her eyes, T thank you. And no, what happened? Okako demanded. But she already knew, they all knew. There were only two people missing now. Two that hadn't been pulled out of the forest. Midoriya and Shoto, Shinso voiced, almost a whisper. They're gone. Chapter 32, Where Are We? Shoto came to tie to a chair in the corner of a dingy bar. Faking sleep, he shut his eyes again before they'd opened more than a fraction, he struggled against his restraints. With the cuffs he was wearing, he could easily use his eyes to shatter them and break free, although there was something around his legs too, likely rope. He could burn that and run. These thoughts of escape buzzed in his mind so quickly that he'd barely even processed what had happened to him by the time he knew how to break free. He didn't open his eyes, but that telltale smell of a bonfire was all he needed. Dabby was here. And then he remembered, he remembered what had happened at the summer camp, the magician, the portal. Wait, Midoriya. Midoriya was here too, right? Without thinking, he opened his eyes in a panic, whipping his head around in a desperate bid to locate his friend. But Midoriya was nowhere to be seen. There he is. Shoto slowly turned his head, and his furious eyes lay upon that of his brother. You came to quite suddenly there, Dabby chuckled. Don't worry, you're perfectly safe. How did you find us, at the summer camp, no one knew where that was supposed to be. Dabby rolled his eyes and pulled from his pocket, a brick phone, the red, number 15 painted across the back. I bugged your stupid brick phone before we went to Hosu, although I didn't think you'd actually be stupid enough to run off. Luckily enough, it came of use after all. Shoto didn't reply, mainly because he couldn't think of a response to that. Instead, he gazed around, taking in his surroundings. He'd been right in his first guess of being in a bar. It was small, dark, and stunk of a mixture of odors that he'd rather not describe, let's just say overall, it was a cocktail of death and smoke. Out of all the random places he'd mysteriously woken up in, this was by far the worst. It was not improved by the fact that it wasn't just him and Dabby there. The magician who took them stood in the corner, flicking through a pack of cards. Beside him, were three other villains Shoto didn't recognize, one with a lizard quirk, one wearing a black and white costume of sorts, and the last being tall, with shoulder-length hair and large sunglasses. Worst of all, was the leader of the League of Villains, Shigaraki himself, sitting in a bar stool close to Dabi, in front of that warp villain, Kurojiri, who absent-mindedly cleaned glasses behind the counter. You got a haircut, Dabi acknowledged. Shoto bared his teeth at him. Dabi raised his hands, just trying to make conversation. Come on, it's not like you to be this aggressive towards me. Shut up, Shoto snarled. I don't want to hear any more from you, where is Midoriya? Well, technically, to know about that you'd need to hear from. I wasn't talking to you, Shoto snapped at Dabi, shutting him up. Shigaraki looked up, turning his head, Shoto saw he was still wearing one of those gross, detached hands, covering most of his face. He'll be back soon, Shigaraki replied slowly. Where, is he? Shoto demanded a little louder this time. With Sensei. Who? At that, Shigaraki stood up. Dabi watched as he strolled over to the middle of the room. You've caused us a lot of trouble, he said. Good, Shoto replied. We're not against you, Shoto, Dabi reasoned. Shoto shook his head, I'm not falling for this again. I've made up my mind, and that's final. I'm not joining your stupid little club of villains. Shigaraki gave Dabi a look, 
who sighed and stood up, walking until he was right in front of Shoto, where he knelt down so he was a little below eye level. So, you're on your dear old dad's side now, huh? With the heroes? No, yes, not with Endeavor. I couldn't care less about him. Shoto, I don't know why this is so hard for you. Dabby laughed, Endeavor, is a hero. If you're with the heroes, you're with him. So, if you want me to help you, we've got to start seeing eye to eye again, alright. Shoto was this close to kicking him, if his feet weren't tied together and to the chair, that was. The world isn't as black and white as that, Shoto snapped. He's an awful person, but, he still helps people. I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to fix it the right way. Oh. And how's that? By doing exactly what he wants you to do, and prance around, being a hero. You talk like you're so much better than him. Shoto lashed out, surprised by the volume of his own voice, surrounded by all these frightening people. But you're not. You know, I've come to realize that you're not that different from him. Hurting whoever gets in your way, burning people, doing whatever it takes to get to the top. Endeavor was raising me to be like him, and you're saying that by being a hero on my own terms, he succeeded. Well, it was between that, and letting you raise me to be like you. He paused to take in the darkness that came over his brother's face. You may be on opposite sides, Shoto breathed, but you're the same. Unspoken words moved between them. Like father, like son. Dabby stood up, they've gotten in your head. You say that like it's a bad thing. It is. Well, once, you did the same to me. If you really wanted to help me, you would have gotten me out at the start. That's why you joined this stupid league of villains, because they tried to get to me. Well, I'm not going to be a weapon for you to use against the heroes anymore. So, let me go, or kill me. I'm of no use to you. Dabby walked back to the bar, perching on a stool again. Silence overcame them all, filled only by the sound of the magician shuffling his cards. Would you stop that, hissed the lizard man. The magician held the cards away from him, a deck of cards must be thoroughly shuffled before they are of proper use. It is an art form that you clearly do not appreciate. Shoto realized, as the cards were shuffled, that there were numbers inked on the back of some of them, 1 to 20, with two copies of number 19, one crossed out. It was obvious what they stood for. He must have caught the magician's eye under his mask, because with a flick of his hands, he perfectly pulled two cards from the deck, now held between his index and middle finger, the numbers 15 and 18 glared back at him. The magician turned away and kept shuffling, until the lizard man had enough, and knocked them straight out of his hands, scattering the cards across the floor. How rude, the magician muttered, not bothering to pick them up. Shigaraki did though. He bent down and carefully selected a particular card, not far away. It was the king of hearts, from what Shoto could see. When he turned it around, he could see the number 18, written on its back. It was my sensei who found Dabi, Shigaraki explained, staring down at the card. He led him here. The rest soon followed. We have a mission, to show the world where the heroes have failed us, to highlight how fragile it really is. Heroes like all might hold society up like a puppet. We will cut the strings, take down the illusion of control. Because we're all villains, really. They put you in class A because they know the risk you pose. We are a team, dedicated to uncovering the lies that hold heroes together. I know you see it too, all of your little class A does. He showed him the 18 on the back of that card again, red eyes gleaming with malice. We can help free you, free you all. I'm currently tied to a chair, Shoto spat. And you speak of freedom. Shigaraki glared at him. And the heroes haven't done the same. Dabi spoke up, grinning because he knew he was right. I'm on my side, Shoto insisted, spitting the words like venom. Class A's side, and you're right, we do see what's wrong with the heroes. But unlike you, we can see what's wrong with you too. Say all you want. I'm not helping you. Silence. Shigaraki continued to stare, as though willing Shoto to disintegrate before him, without the use of his quirk. Eventually, he broke that hold, tossing the card into the air and walking back over to the bar. He reached for a remote, and turned on a TV screen, suspended above the counter. Days since the disappearance of two members of UA's Class 1A, for the rehabilitation of villainous youths. 
the head of the class, Izuku Midoriya, and his classmate, the son of the number two hero, Shoto Todoroki, said a news anchor, standing outside of the iconic, H-shaped building of UA, just beyond the gates that blocked the mob's entry to the school. A majority of the first-year hero course remains in hospital after an attack at their summer training camp by so-called League of Villains, who the heroes believe to be concealing the missing students. Moreover, a member of the hero team, the Wild, Wild Pussycats, Ragdoll, remains unaccounted for. More on this story tomorrow, at the press conference held by. The TV was turned off unceremoniously, and Shigaraki slowly turned back to Shoto. He couldn't believe it, why were they making it out like they wanted to go with the league? Some of Class A had to have been injured too, what happened to them? Don't worry, Shigaraki grinned. You've already helped plenty. Worst field trip ever, muttered Mina, sitting with her legs huddled against her chest in the living room. Of all time, echoed more than one voice in response. Eureka simply sniffed, closing Deku's notebook before she could smudge it with any more of her tears. It had been three days since the abrupt end of the summer camp. They were taken back to UA as soon as they had the chance to. Every day since, few had spoken, silent words of comfort drifting in the air. They'd been sitting like this for a while now, in silence, gathered in the common room area in their dwindling number. Sato had been making cupcakes and cookies, a great comfort in such a difficult time. Mr. Izawa was out somewhere, about to lead a press conference alongside Vlad King and Principal Nizu. Midnight was keeping an eye on both classes in the meantime. Hagakure and Jiro were in hospital, asleep like so many of Class B Momo was with them for a while too, with a serious injury to her head. Mr. Izawa had promised he'd find a way to allow them to visit soon enough, but Momo had been discharged from the hospital anyway. She kept in contact with them via their brick phones and should be back within the hour. And then of course, there was Shoto and Deku. They desperately attempted to contact them through their brick phones too. But much to their disappointment, Deku's phone was soon found amongst his belongings at the camp, and although Shoto's couldn't be located, he wasn't answering. However, they did find the answer to something Deku had wondered about during their first escape attempt. No, Yue did not put trackers in the brick phones. Moreover, they couldn't trace Shoto's if he didn't use it. Likely, it had been confiscated from him or destroyed. Speaking of trackers, Klasa currently weren't wearing theirs. No one had arrived to put them back on, and the anklets were likely sitting in a drawer somewhere in the main school. Yue was a little too busy at the moment to deal with such matters, and Class A wasn't exactly complaining. We have to know, Tsu suddenly voiced, making everyone perk up. Tell us, is someone here a traitor? No one replied. A few shifted their gaze around, perhaps trying to locate guilt in another's expression. We won't tell anyone, Eureka added quietly. Maybe you didn't know their plan, it's okay. Will, understand. More silence followed. I don't believe anyone here would do that, Kiri's him and nodded to himself, eyes sure as he gazed back at Tsu and Yurika, who were sitting next to each other, squished on an armchair. Me neither, Shinso spoke up, followed by numerous nods around the room. Yurika ran her thumb over the notebook in her lap, examining the fading scorch marks on the splodgy, red A that spanned the entirety of the front cover. Bakugo, she said. He stood up immediately, you think it was me, huh, he retorted, anger quickly rising. W.L. I. I'm not a freaking villain. None of us are, Bakugo. Kiri's Hima exclaimed, leaping up to stand between him and Eureka. That's the whole idea. But. But what, huh. S. She has a point, you know. Not that I think you'd ever do such a thing, but out of all of us, you are the only one who's gone against Midoriya, and you don't exactly get along with Shoto either, man. We're not putting the blame on you, we're just pointing out what, what the detective might ask, because he's bound to come around here eventually, okay. Bakugo just stared for a moment, looking, betrayed. That's just what you've all always thought of me, isn't it? No one replied. Kiri's Hima frowned at him, confused. You think I'm the villain? No, Bakugo. That's not what we're saying Kiri's Hima tried. No, he yelled, pushing Kiri's Hima away harshly. In that moment Eureka could see a look on his face she'd never seen before, he was, scared. Why am I always the bad guy, he sounded so hurt that Eureka almost broke. She shuffled away from Tsu and got up, still holding onto Deku's notebook. 
Hesitantly, once she made eye contact with Bakugo, she flipped through the book to a highly graffitied page and handed it over. It was his page. He took one look at it and tossed it to the ground. Undeterred, Yurika picked it back up again, and started to read. 17, Katsuki Bakugo, Kaken, Class 1A, she paused and looked up, expecting him to stop her and storm off, but he didn't. He just stood there, arms crossed, his head hung low, staring at the ground. Villain. Be but, that's what's written in nearly all our pages, mine, and Momo's, Deku's. She flipped to the page and showed it to him. It was essentially blank. He'd written barely anything on himself, just his name and number, the word villain, and then quirkless, written in big, bold letters. You're, like us. As more silence followed, Eureka decided to continue. Weaknesses, the rain and water, the cold, and a competitive nature. Bakugo's hands balled into fists. He struggles to work in a team and cooperate with others. A powerful quirk is not what makes a hero. The room was deadly quiet. The calm before the storm, as they waited for his inevitable outburst. There's also a drawing of an angry pom-pom dog. He snatched the book back off Eureka. She leaned over to point it out, I drew the dog. Bakugo sighed deeply, dropping his arms to his sides. After a moment, he closed the book and stared at the front cover, matching his fingers up with the prints he'd left behind months ago. Aitsa stepped forwards, you have what Midoriya does not, a powerful quirk. However, you must appreciate that in turn, he has something that you don't. I don't think I need to explain to you what that is. Bakugo didn't reply, but that was far better than any backlash one would usually expect from him. A powerful quirk is not what makes a hero, Aitsa repeated, stepping a little closer and tapping the top of that notebook. But it is unfortunately an important aspect of it. You said that Midoriya cannot be a hero because he lacks one. In return, he said that you cannot be a hero, because although you possess a heroic power, you do not have a heroic nature. Tsu nodded from her armchair, that's why Midoriya put you here, isn't it? Think about it, man, Kiri's Hima interjected, resting a hand on Bakugo's shoulder that he quickly shrugged off. Midoriya's smart, and he never would have put you here if he didn't believe you had what it takes to be a great hero. He said that himself, remember. All of us have had to learn something here, it's not a bad thing that you're feeling like this. We've been through it too. It's like what Mr. Izawa said, Yurika added, meeting Bakugo's eyes with a look as confident and sure as she could muster, right at the beginning of term. If we want to graduate, we have to answer the questions we ask ourselves. We have to understand why we're here, and what we're gonna do about it. Yeah. Kiri's Hima exclaimed, grin fiercely. So, come on, man. What are you going to do about it? He stared down at that notebook again, flimsy pages, crumpling under his grip. After a moment, he began to frown. He looked up at the whiteboard before them, with their butchered names scribbled all over. Even Shinso had gotten a few cruel nicknames since he joined. And then, Bakugo began to smile. It was strange, how much he mirrored Deku, as he turned back to them all and said. We're gonna break out of UA. Midoriya didn't know where he was. But what scared him more, was that he didn't know where Shoto was either. He remembered being pulled through that portal, roughly tossed into an unfamiliar room, and desperately trying to get to his feet, ready for another fight. But he didn't know where his sword had gone, and he held no other weapons. He caught a glimpse of Shoto's two-toned hair, and before he could think his situation through any further, he blacked out. Now, he was awake again. He wasn't where he'd found himself when the villains first took him, that was for sure. He didn't remember much of the place, but the floor had been wooden. Here, the floor was either stone or metal. He wasn't touching it, so he couldn't tell. He lay on a bed. He could hear the gentle, rhythmic beeping of a heart monitor, gently beginning to increase in frequency as he felt his panic rise. He clocked the foredrip, noted the bandages across his arms and legs and sticking out from under his shirt, and after a moment more, finally acknowledged his aching pains. He could barely remember his fight with Muscular, not a good sign, but the villain wasn't trying to kill him. Maybe he broke a couple of bones, but Midoriya wasn't quite sure. He'd been so hyper-focused on saving Kota, and then rescuing his classmates, that his brain seemed to bypass any natural measurements of self-preservation. Regardless, he felt better now. 
he pushed any feelings of being glad he never got around to realizing how much pain he'd really been in a way, as he sat up and gazed around him. This was not the time for feeling remotely thankful. Good, 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 perfect timing. Midoriya's breath hitched in surprise when a stranger casually strolled into the room. An older looking man with short stature, a hefty, white mustache, and steampunk styled goggles. Midoriya narrowed his eyes, come to think of it, this stranger had a strange air of familiarity about him, but he couldn't quite place it. The predictability of quirkless subjects, the man exclaimed. No surprise complications, no mysterious alterations to metabolism. Oh, the beauty of human normality. There were a whole host of questions Midoriya could have asked. For some reason, what slipped out was, who are you? His voice was croaky from disuse. For now, your doctor, the old man answered, approaching him and beginning to disconnect wires and tubes. Midoriya made no objection and let him do his work. It was clear he'd helped heal him, so he couldn't have been in much danger in the current moment. Where am I? Midoriya asked after a few minutes more, spent watching the doctor scurry around the room. Perfectly safe, he replied. It, wasn't much of an answer. Again, he made no complaint. As the man started to replace some of the bandages on Midoriya's arms, he risked a third question, why am I here? You are here he paused as he cut a length of bandage off with a pair of scissors, to speak to a good friend of mine. He has taken good care of me, as I have done for him. He will do the same for you. The answers were so vague and cryptic that Midoriya concluded that it was best not asking any more. Instead, he sat there and waited, letting the doctor go about whatever routine he had established during however long Midoriya had been here, unconscious and healing. Where is Shoto? Midoriya suddenly found himself asking, despite the conclusion he had come to. With his brother. Midoriya blinked. How did he know? Natsuo. Dabi. That couldn't be good. Well, Shoto being with Dabi was bad enough, but Midoriya was more referring to the fact that this strange doctor knew about Dabi's relationship with Endeavor, which was supposed to be a secret. His panicked mind were to many distant places, from Shoto to the League to Jiro and back again. He didn't know how much time had elapsed before the doctor was standing by his bedside again, waiting. Midoriya turned to stare at him, awaiting instruction. Up you get then, he insisted exasperatingly, as though he'd already asked this once and was now repeating it. Midoriya did as he was told, kicking his legs off the side of the bed and getting up. He felt a little unsteady, but his legs luckily didn't give out underneath him. Good, good. Come with me, and he walked off, to the far side of the rather dark room, and opening a door for Midoriya. He followed, now vaguely aware that the floor was indeed concrete. But other than his shoes, he was not wearing the same clothes he'd disappeared in, likely because they'd been ruined. As they wandered underneath lights down a cold corridor, Midoriya noted that he was wearing a black t-shirt, and matching black trousers. The white of the bandages stood out almost as much as the red of his shoes. In the darkness, he was acutely aware of the sounds that surrounded him as they walked through this maze of a building. They must have been in some kind of tower, like maybe a skyscraper. He could tell from all the stairs, and the way the corridors twisted and turned in a circular fashion. He could hear the distant whirring of machines, the humming of computers, the bubble of some kind of liquid. His eyes focused on the back of the doctor's head. He must have been one of the villains, probably with the League. Strange, if they had a doctor on their side, surely Shigariki's wounds would have been healed faster. Like Midoriya, he'd been shot at the USJ, and from what Midoriya could gather from his few interactions he'd had with him since, they weren't fixed nearly as quickly. At the point where Midoriya was worried he couldn't go on for much longer. The doctor came to a door. There was no lock, he pushed it open without hesitation, and Midoriya cautiously followed. He couldn't tell, but Midoriya was somewhat convinced they were on the top floor of the building, or at least near to. This room was messy. He picked his path carefully, following the doctor the best he could before he disappeared around the corner and out of sight. There were wires and machines littered everywhere. He almost tripped more than once, before reaching the center of the room. He found himself facing someone. The lighting was minutely better here, so it was easier to see his face. But. Midoriya couldn't say the same for him. He wore a black mask, in which there didn't appear to be any sort of hole for his eyes. A few pipes came out of it, and like Midoriya had been back in his makeshift hospital room, 
this man was connected to numerous machines that the doctor instantly began to tamper with. The man sat in a chair, and wore a clean, neat, black suit. It is a pleasure to meet you, Izuka Midoriya, the man said calmly, his voice strangely soothing, yet muffled, and slightly distorted by his mask. Midoriya said nothing, he just stood before him, unsure of what to do. Please, take a seat, he said, gesturing slightly to Midoriya's left. There was a chair there he hadn't quite noticed before. Not wanting to go against the man's words, as he was most clearly the one in control here, Midoriya grabbed the chair and shuffled it forward slightly, so he was directly opposite the man, three or four meters apart. You must have a lot of questions, the man realized. Ask away. Midoriya was very aware this was likely a, very bad man, for the lack of a better description. However, he didn't really want to get on his bad side. He chose his words carefully. How did this happen? T to you, I mean. I was injured, the probably villain explained. I am aware that you have met All Might. He, fought All Might. Midoriya hesitated. Who are you? Well, I have many names. Recently, the two most relevant have been Sensei, or All for One. Shigariki's Sensei. Yes. I assume he has spoken of me. Um, yeah. A moment of silence more, whilst. All for One, waited for further questions. What do you want, from me? I wanted to speak with you, he answered simply. Why? Why would one not want to speak with the likes of you, young Midoriya? Midoriya twiddled his thumbs, trying to stop his hands from shaking. I can see you are scared, all for one acknowledged. You do not need to be. But fear comes with the unknown. To conquer fear, you must conquer the unknown. You, above all, know the true power of knowledge. Such a power can face any force, of any magnitude. However, there always comes that moment when that is simply not enough. Being, normal, in a world where the abnormal, has become average, must make you feel, insignificant. I feel your pain, my child. I too, have no power that is truly my own. Midoriya frowned. Eh. Hey. Quirkless man did such damage to the number one hero? I see you're confused. I I err, a little. Yes, by a certain coincidence, you are already somewhat familiar with my quirk. For I have the ability to take other powers. And suddenly, it all made sense. How the Nomu had multiple quirks, how a man with no power that is truly his own could take on the likes of All Might, how someone like Shigaraki could organize such an extensive operation. Because he didn't, it was his sensei who pulled the strings. He spoke about freeing society when he wasn't free himself. Would you like to know what All Might's power is? Midoriya blinked out of his thoughts, so shocked by the previous revelation that his head was still reeling. All Might possesses the ability to pass on his power. That is it? I, what? It was my brother's quirk, mind you. Rather useless at the time. Until I graciously gave him a stockpiling ability, thinking he was quirkless. It merged with his own power and he passed it on, down generations of heroes, cultivating more power as it went, until it reached young Toshi Nori Yagi, All Might. He was quirkless too, once. Midoriya stood up, almost stumbling backwards over his chair, heart pounding. The quirk is called one for all, poetic, is it not? But almost backwards. You see, in his case, all the power is kept within one individual, whilst my power, all for one, is one which can be utilized to achieve balance across all kinds of people. Midoriya wanted to get away, to run as far as he could, but some morbid fascination kept him rooted in place. Some people don't deserve power, do they, Midoriya, said all for one. Endeavor, Dabi, All Might, Kikin. But they do have it, he added. And some people, they do deserve it? Imagine the difference they could make if they had that power instead. Midoriya didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to think. That is what I can offer to you, All for one proclaimed. He stood up, now disconnected from the wires that had bound him to his seat. All I ask in return, is for you to help me find one for all, the power stolen from me so long ago. All Might has passed it on now, you see. He possesses but a dwindling flame of what once was. His heart was beating so fast he thought it might break free of the cage that was his ribs, W what kind of power, he heard himself say. Anything you want. 
a quirk of your very own. He tried to take a step back, but his feet wouldn't move, be but, you're a villain. If there is no such thing as a hero, this day and age, young Midoriya, is there such thing as a villain? The world looks upon you and labels you as such. Do you think it will ever treat you differently? Don't you want me to help you change their minds? The quirkless soul you are, they don't care. You're here for one reason, and one reason only, because you can see through the cracks, the cracks All Might's illusion holds. Someone has to do something about it, if it's not me, it doesn't look like it's going to be anyone. And if that means burning the bloody whole thing to the freaking ground, then so be it. You've become a monster. You're just the quirkless kid pretending that he can be a hero. You're in denial, you're delusional, have been ever since that bloody day you realized your quirk was never coming. And you still think you're a hero. You're not. And it's freaking annoying. Do something useful with your life. Where you can for once not be the stinking Deku you've always been. I think the name Deku sounds like Dekaru, Ken. So it's like, you can do it. And I thought that was fitting. Heroes are people with the quirks to help where other people can't. Deku doesn't freaking have that. So, is it really your lack of a quirk, or is it the people, holding you back? I can be a villain, but I can't be a hero. I can ruin everything, but I'm not allowed to help. And Midoriya did, he wanted to change their minds. He did so badly. He wanted to make a difference. He wanted to leave his hurt and pain behind. Once, he would have said he'd do anything for a quirk. He looked up at the man before him, knowing, not too deep down, that this was a man preying on the childish spark of hope that remained. I am a patient man, all for one said after too long of a silence. Have some time to think it over. He turned to his doctor, could you escort our guest back to his room? And perhaps bring him something to eat? If it is not too much to ask. Of course, of course, the old man replied, reappearing from whatever shadow he had been lurking in, come with me and he started to wander off again. Midoriya wavered before following, turning back to all for one. Come, the doctor called out. Midoriya tore his gaze away and followed him into the darkness. He had a lot to think about. All right, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.